So hi, uh, Ian Finley here. This is the second video uh, about the process of playwriting. Um, today we're going to be talking about conflict and dialogue because the thing to keep in mind is that as a playwright, what you really are is a script writer. You're writing a very specific sort of document that you then give to actors and give to directors and they actually make the play. So unlike like when you're writing a, a short story or you're writing a poem, you write it and you give it right to the audience. It's a direct transfer. It's like a finished product in your hand. When you write a script, it's not a finished product. It's sort of the opposite of that. Um, you do not give the script right to the audience. Instead, you give it to a bunch of other artists, and then they create the thing that they give to the audience. So when you're writing a script, it's less like writing a short story or a poem or an essay, and more like drawing up blueprints. Uh, blueprints are a series of instructions that you then give to um, the contractor and the builder, and then they build the thing itself that you can live in. Um, and that's why blueprints have a very specific sort of um, a look and they include some very specific information so they can build the house that you want. You can't just like draw a picture of a house and say build that because if they build it it would collapse and people would die and it would be your fault. So to prevent people from dying um, we use a very specific format when we make blueprints which means that we also um, perhaps not to prevent people from dying, but who knows. We use the same specific format when we make a script. We'll talk about what that looks like in the next video, which is on something we call manuscript format. But today we're going to talk about what's in that script that you write. Uh, the information that you are giving to the actors to make sure that what they perform is what you had in your head. And if you do it right, it's really exciting because then you have a character in your head doing something and you put it into this format on a piece of paper, you give it to the actors, and suddenly you see that person who was in your head up there on a stage doing that and they have stepped out of your head into reality and that's kind of exciting but to do that you have to give them some specific information. Um, <clears throat> there are basically two things that you can include in a script and that is what the characters say and that's what the characters do. Um, what comes out of their mouth and then what they physically do on stage. Those are the two things that, that actors uh, can do on a stage. So those are the two things that are going to be in your script. We call what they say the dialogue and what they do the stage directions. So anything that needs to happen on stage needs to be put in the script. One of my teachers always said, if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage. Uh, so anything that you need to happen, anything that needs to be said or anything that needs to be done, shows up in your script either as dialogue or as a stage direction. <clears throat> and we'll talk in the next video about sort of how you format those things. Um, but that is what you get. Now this is, for those of you who are writing for the first time, uh, a play, this could be a little bit um, challenging because you may be used to writing a short story where you have all these other tools where you can say what's going on inside the character's mind, where you can have omniscient narration that says, okay, meanwhile something else is happening over here. You can tell the story using a lot of different tools that you don't have in a play. In a play, all you have is what the characters say and what the characters do. So anything that is internal to the characters, like what the character is thinking, you've got to find some way to pull out and make obvious to the, act, to the, um, the audience. For example, <clears throat> you wouldn't want to have a stage direction that says, uh, Ian stares off into the distance thinking about his dead squirrel. Because how does the audience know I'm thinking about my dead squirrel and not my dead rattlesnake? I, I have neither a squirrel nor a rattlesnake. Anyway, um, you can't say what's in the, uh, the actor's mind. You have to say what they actually do and hope that the audience gets that. So for example, if you had a stage direction, Ian picks up a picture of a squirrel and looks at it longingly and then the live dialect says, oh, Bobby squirrel. Then the audience might get that there is a missing squirrel here. Um, because of what the character does and what the character says. That's dialogue and stage directions, and that's what you put in a script. The other thing to keep in mind about a script, we're going to talk about now because it's really important, is what we call conflict. Conflict is something we try to avoid in our lives, but it is absolutely necessary in a script. You cannot write a script without conflict. And by conflict, I do not mean just bad things happening. Um, you could write a play where a lot of bad things happen, but there's no conflict. Conflict is defined as two forces in opposition, two forces banging against one another, because that's what's going to be interesting for us to watch. Um, people are very strange. 
Uh, we do not want to see characters be happy for two hours. That's why it's called a happy ending. When the characters are happy, the play is over. But we will pay $20 or $40 or $140 on Broadway to sit in a darkened room for two hours and watch people suffer for two hours. Now eventually, yes, we get them to be happy at the end, but that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is watching them overcome these obstacles and engage with this conflict. That's just how human beings are built. So if you want your play to be interesting, you've got to have conflict. Um, the Greeks, remember that Aristotle guy? They had a fancy word for conflict. They called it agon. So you may hear me use that word, agon. It just means conflict. It's the same word we get our word agony from, which means pain and suffering, right? Um, so your play has got to have agon. It's got to have conflict, which means there's got to be someone who starts the agon. The Greek word for start is proto, like in prototype. Um, so you've got to have a proto agonist. Nowadays, we just drop that O and we call them your protagonist. We're going to talk more about them when we talk about structure. But the protagonist, um, what your English teacher may have called the main character, for example, although it's not always the main character, we'll talk about that later. But your protagonist is the most important character in your play, because they're the character who wants something bad, and bad enough to get into all kinds of conflict over it and create the Aegon that drives your play forward. So when it comes to conflict, when it comes to Aegon, there are three types that I want to go over. I'm sorry, four types. I can count, I promise. Um, and you want to layer these conflicts in. The most obvious type is person versus person. This is where you've got one character who wants something and another character who wants something else, and they interact with one another, and they argue, or they fight, or there's a gun battle, or there's um, a trial. Um, there's some sort of person versus person interaction trying to get that one. This is the most common type of conflict, and it's also, I think, in many ways, the best type of conflict. You also have person versus environment, which is where there's something physical around those characters that's getting in the way. Uh, action movies do this all the time. Um, the building is on fire, or the ship is sinking, or there's a tornado coming, or there's Godzilla coming. These are all versus environment. There are things that are happening in the world that are getting in the way of the character getting what they want. These are very good if you're writing a screenplay. They are often a little less powerful on stage, although there, you can certainly have a versus environment element to a conflict on stage. If you, you know, the people are uh, in a cave and they're freezing or they're running out of food, these are all versus environment. Just a quick note, this is something my students have asked me about. It's not versus nature, because there's lots of versus environment stuff that are not natural. If you think of the movie Titanic, for example, the ship sinks in Titanic. I hope that didn't spoil anything for anyone. Um, so that is a versus environment conflict. All this is going on while the ship is sinking. That's a versus environment because the ship is their environment. But it's not versus nature. I guess the iceberg was nature, but the ship is not nature. It didn't grow like on a ship tree anyway. So small, small uh, uh, point there. Um, you also have uh, person versus society. This is where the character, your protagonist or another character with this conflict, is going up against something bigger than they are, and typically bigger and that you can't touch. So fighting against an unjust law or an oppressive government or fighting against what society thinks of a person. Um, oftentimes, this sort of conflict turns into a person versus person conflict. Um, because you can't just have a character on stage saying, oh, I hate you, world, because you know, who are they going to punch? You've got to have somebody for them to punch. So there often is a person who represents that society who then this conflict, person versus society, becomes a conflict with that person. There is, for example, in the play Antigone, which is about a girl fighting against this oppressive government, there's a guy, the ruler, Creon, who represents that oppressive government. So the conflict then becomes with Creon. The fourth sort of conflict, which is both the most interesting and also the most difficult to write, is person versus self. And this is where there is some sort of conflict internal to the person. Like we said, a conflict doesn't mean bad things happening. It means two forces pushing against one another. And those two forces can be inside you as well. Um, every morning I face 
versus self, conflict. I'm laying in my bed and my alarm goes off. It's like, oh, I want to get up and be productive and do all these things. At the same time, I have another one, which is my bed is so comfortable. I don't ever want to leave this bed ever. Um, and so inside of me, there are two wants, and those wants are banging up against one another, and that creates conflict. Of course, there's bigger versus self-conflict. If you know the play Hamlet, it's all about this guy who both wants to do the right thing and avenge his father's death. At the same time, he also does not want to be a killer. He wants to be a good person who does not kill people. Two wants banging up against him, and it makes for a really interesting character and a really interesting conflict. So those are the sorts of conflict, and you can layer them on like a layer cake. Very rarely do you have just one sort of conflict. Usually you have two or three or four of them in a scene. Um, and that's the conflict that's going to drive your play forward, the play that you construct with dialogue and with stage directions.